Freedom, a word that is now synonymous to an iconic Scottish knight, one Sir William Wallace. They may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! He was a polarising figure and a formidable leader, partially responsible for the English defeat at the Battle of Stirling Bridge and helped to inspire the Scots to achieve their independence from the English during the First War of Scottish Independence. He is widely remembered as a patriot and a national hero in Scotland. His life and deeds have been told in the form of an epic poem called The Wallace by Blind Harry, subject to literary works by Jane Porter and Sir Walter Scott, and most famously portrayed by Mel Gibson in the Academy Award winning film Braveheart. But all forms of entertainment use creative license. Today we want to strip back the gifts, the films and the poems and find out just who was Sir William Wallace. I'm Dave. And I'm Josh of Nerd and Dragon. And today we're taking a deep dive into Sir William Wallace. The Unknown Outlaw Unlike many other historical figures we have examined previously, little is known about Wallace's upbringing, the date he was born, or even who his father was. The following is a mixture of speculation and educated conjecture from historians. It is believed that Wallace was born circa 1270 and was born to lesser nobility or a landowner. There is a debate surrounding who Wallace was born to. The chronicler Blind Harry in the late 15th century poem The Wallace named his father as Sir Malcolm of Eldersley, a vassal of James V, steward of Scotland. However, in 1990, a letter from Wallace to the hands of Lubeck was returned to the city of Lubeck. The letter is thought to contain Wallace's own seal. A reconstruction of the seal showed the words Willemus Philivis Alani Wallaces, which according to the National Records of Scotland has been translated by two historians to read William, son of Alan Wallace. The historians Archie Duncan and Fiona Watson hypothesised that this could be the same Alan Wallace listed in the 1296 Fragment Rolls as Crown Tenant of Ayrshire, but nothing is able to confirm this. Most historians and the Society for William Wallace itself still believe that Wallace was born of Sir Malcolm. As explored by Tony Robinson, it is believed that the Wallace family were minor nobility descended from aristocracy, possibly Norman, who would have owned land which was reinforced with a palisade fort, and although thought themselves Scottish, would have still spoken French. Further adding to the debate around Wallace's heritage, the linguist Tom MacArthur states that the surname Wallace is thought to have been derived from the Old English name of Wallish, meaning foreigner, or Welshman. Some historians believe that the Wallaces may have been medieval immigrants from Wales. The chronicler Walter Bower recorded Wallace as a tall man with the body of a giant, with lengthy flanks, broad in the hips, with strong arms and legs, with all his limbs very strong and firm, whilst blind Harry's Wallace reaches seven feet tall. Little else is known of Wallace's upbringing, although it is believed that he must have had some military training in order to be so successful in his campaign against the English. So, now we have covered the, to be quite honest, confusing origins of William Wallace, let's get into what we do know, starting with the political landscape of Scotland at the time. The Great Cause and English Invasion During Wallace's formative years, Scotland was experiencing a period of political turmoil, which later became known as the Great Cause. King Alexander III had died in 1286, breaking his neck when falling from his horse on a stormy evening in Kinghorn. He had no living children and left the crown to his granddaughter, Margaret. However, she was only three years old at the time of her grandfather's death and resided in Norway until 1290 when she set sail for Scotland. She would never be crowned. During her voyage to Scotland, she fell ill and upon reaching the Orkney Islands in September 1290, she would die. With no clear successor to the crown, 13 families began vying for the throne of Scotland. The most credible claims were thought to have been that of John Balliol and Robert Bruce, grandfather of the future king. After two years of being unable to determine a king and the country threatening to succumb to a civil war, King Edward I of England was invited to arbitrate the situation. This is where the first signs of an impending English invasion would show itself. Edward would demand that the contenders recognise him as Lord Paramount of Scotland. On the 17th of November 1292 in the Great Hall of Berwick Castle, after listening to and mulling over the claims of each of the 13 families, 
the Scottish auditors decided that John Balliol had the strongest claim to the throne. He was subsequently inaugurated on the 30th of November 1292 on St Andrew's Day. Throughout the reign of John Balliol, his rule was consistently undermined by King Edward. The English king would demand homage to be paid to him, demand assistance of his troops in his fight against Wales and France, and embarrass him whenever he came to court at Westminster. The Scots quickly grew tired of the new king and his inaction, and in 1295 eventually formed the Council of Twelve, which, in essence, was a new form of guardianship in Scotland. Shortly after the council was formed, the guardians would go on to sign the old alliance with France, who had recently declared England's possession of Gascony forfeit. The alliance was signed by John Balliol and King Philip IV of France, stipulating that if either country were attacked by England, they would invade English territory. In retaliation for Scotland signing this treaty, Edward ordered the storming and massacre at Berwick-upon-Tweed, which although in modern-day England used to be a royal borough of Scotland. This begun the First War of Scottish Independence. It is said that Edward massacred half of the population of Berwick over the course of three days, men and children slain in front of mothers. It is believed Edward only ordered the end of the assault when he saw one of his men slaying a woman during childbirth. The river was said to have run red with blood during those three days. Edward would go on to force John to abdicate his throne, which he did on the 10th of July 1296. On that day, John had his Scottish arms stripped from his surcoat. John would later be referred to as Tomb Tabard, meaning empty coat. With Scotland without a monarch, Edward would go on to continue to invade Scotland, appointing sheriffs to rule in villages and cities. It is thought that he believed with an ability neutered, the populace would fall in line. How very wrong he was. A hero emerges. In May 1297, William Wallace's name begins to appear in the annals of history, killing the English sheriff of Lanark, William de Hesselrig, and burning Lanark. It is said that Wallace and 30 other men snuck into the town in ones and twos throughout the day, then come nightfall, attacked the English soldiers. Historians believe that Wallace's killing of Hesselrig was particularly brutal, surprising the sheriff during his sleep and cleaving through the skull down to his collarbone with his huge bastard sword. Not done there, Wallace struck the corpse a further two times. Wallace's men slaughtered any English men they came across, leaving only women, children, and priests alive. Joined by Sir William Douglas, Wallace next marched on Scone, drove out the English Justicaire, and attacked the English garrisons between the rivers Forth and Tay. The Scottish steward Robert the Bruce and others now gathered an army, but it was forced to surrender at Irvine by Sir Henry de Percy and Robert de Clifford in July 1297. Wallace, however, remained in action, with a large company in the forest of Selkirk. According to a contemporary report made to Edward, Wallace laid siege to Dundee but abandoned it to oppose an English army that was advancing towards Stirling under John de Warren, Earl of Surrey, as King Edward was still fighting in France. Surrey failed to bring Wallace to terms outside Stirling, and on the morning of September 11th, 1297, the English began to file across a narrow bridge over the Forth. Wallace, in a position northwest of Abbey Craig, held back their troops until about half of the English had crossed. They then attacked with such sudden fury that almost all of whom across were either killed or driven into the river and drowned. Surrey, with the rest of his army, retreated hastily, having first destroyed the bridge, but the Scots crossed by a ford and pursued them. With only a small following, Surrey escaped to Berwick and then York. For the moment, Scotland was almost free of occupation. A letter long survived in which Wallace, writing from Haddington on October the 11th, urged the Hanseatic towns of Hamburg and Lübeck to resume trade with Scotland now recovered by war from the power of the English. Wallace now ravaged Northumberland and Cumberland, burning Annick and besieging Carlisle. To the monks of Hexham, however, he granted special protection. Upon returning to Scotland early in December 1297, Wallace was knighted and was elected or assumed the title of Guardian of the Kingdom. In the name of King John de Balio, then a prisoner in London, Wallace set himself to reorganise the army and regulate the affairs of the country. He seems to have acted wisely and vigorously and to have been supported by Bishop Robert Wishart of Glasgow, the steward's brother, Sir John Stuart, Sir John Graham of Dundaff, Sir John Comyn, the Red, Robert the Bruce, and others. Some nobles, many of whom had English estates and hostages in Edward's hands, were only lukewarm to Wallace's leadership, and his position depended entirely upon his success on the battlefield. Early in 1298, Surrey returned and relieved the English-held castles of Roxburgh and Berwick. 
but by Edward's orders advanced no farther. Edward himself crossed the Tweed on July the 3rd and moved towards Stirling with a strong force of heavy cavalry, a body of archers and Irish and Welsh auxiliaries. Wallace retreated slowly, wasting the country behind him so Edward's force could not resupply itself on the march. Edward, with his army half-starved and mutinous, was on the point of retreat when early on July 21st, near Kirkliston, he learned that Wallace was awaiting him near Falkirk. Edward advanced and on the following day found Wallace on a carefully chosen sloping ground, his front protected by a small river. The English cavalry, having with some difficulty crossed the river and the adjacent marshy ground, launched a repeated charges on the four shilterns of Wallace's spearmen. They drove off the field the small body of Scottish horse and the common, but made no impression on the shilterns and suffered considerable losses. The archers, however, now advanced and the deadly volleys soon broke up the spearmen's ranks and further cavalry charges turned them to flight. Thousands of the Scots were slain in the pursuit and among the dead were Sir John Stuart and Sir John de Graham. Wallace retired northward with the survivors, burning Stirling and Perth as he went. Edward, unable to maintain his forces in Scotland, returned south, reaching Carlisle on September the 8th. His military reputation ruined, Wallace resigned the guardianship in December 1298 and was succeeded by Bruce and Comyn. A Scottish Martyr There is some evidence that Wallace went to France in 1299 and thereafter returned to Scotland to act as a solitary guerrilla leader, but from the autumn of 1299 nothing is known of his activities for more than four years. The rebellion he had led nevertheless continued until 1304, at which point most Scottish nobles submitted to Edward. How much this continued resistance was due to Wallace's influence is uncertain, but Wallace was the one leader to whom Edward would never offer any terms of capitulation, and to whom he most persistently tried to capture. On August 5, 1305, Wallace was arrested near Glasgow by Sir John Menteith, and according to two early chroniclers, by treachery. He was carried to Dumbarton Castle and then to London, having possibly been brought before King Edward along the way. On August the 23rd, 1305, Wallace was conveyed to Westminster Hall, where he was indicted and condemned to death. There was no trial because he was declared a traitor to the king. Wallace emphatically denied this charge, as he had never sworn allegiance to Edward. That same day, he was hanged, disemboweled, and finally beheaded and quartered at Smithfield. His head was set on London Bridge and his limbs exposed at Newcastle, Berwick, Stirling and Perth. In 1306, Robert the Bruce would raise the rebellion that would eventually succeed in Scottish independence. Scotland gained its independence some 23 years after Wallace's execution with the Treaty of Edinburgh in 1328. And Wallace has since been remembered as one of Scotland's greatest heroes. Josh here, we both really enjoyed researching this video and getting to watch Braveheart again. It was fun to revisit William Wallace, having one time written a dissertation about his significance. We really hope you enjoyed this video, liking and subscribing helps us out loads. Thank you all for watching!